Hello, my name is Sean Boyle and I teach at Southern Illinois University in the Automotive Technology Program. And if you've been watching some of my videos, my automatic transmission videos, you probably notice I vacuum test a lot of things in the transmission and the valve body. So you're like, how can I get into this vacuum testing? And you can buy this vacuum test plate straight from Sonex. Or actually, I'll go through distributor, but it's the Sonex test plate costs a little less than $200 and it's really well built. Um, actually, I recommend that if you can afford that. But if you want to make one of your own, you can pretty much do it for that same thing for about 70 bucks or less, just buying stuff off Amazon. So I'm going to go through everything I got here I got from Amazon. Um, I did buy, I did actually make another one before this, and I bought a lot of the stuff at the local hardware store, and it worked pretty much the same. So we're going to go through on how to build one of these things on your own. And you pretty much, including the price of a vacuum pump, you can have a vacuum test station for less than $150. And it might sound like a lot, but if you're overhauling these transmissions and you're trying to determine if a valve body is good or bad or what you have to address in the valve body, it'll save you money in the long run really quick. So let's first look at some of these components I bought. This right here is a vacuum gauge. It measures zero to 30 inches of vacuum and it's water filled. It even has the adapter that goes from quarter inch to eighth inch pipe thread, which I need. And that was only $13. And for $8, you can buy a two pack of brass tees, which you'll need. And for $7, you can get a two pack of these eighth inch pipe thread brass nipples. $8 a piece, you can get these needle valves. And the ones I got have a, a female and a male end on it. And that saves me from getting some additional couplers and fittings by doing that. Then these push connect fittings right here, they, they're only like um, $12 for a pack of five. And they're made out of metal. And they had pretty good ratings. So I got these and those fit into this plastic line. And this is actually pneumatic line. And the big thing when you buy this pneumatic line is you wanna make sure you're getting something that can handle the pressures. Now we're just doing vacuum testing here. So it's really 15 PSI, negative 15 PSI is the most that this would ever see. So pretty much anything will work. But when I bought this, this line, I also use this to do pressure testing on the transmissions. So if I wanna check line pressure, or any kind of hydraulic pressure on the transmission, I use this same kind of line and uh, these push connect fittings because it makes it really easy to kind of route it any way I want. Seems like pressure gauges always have too short of a hose or they're, they're too bulky or they don't want to fish around. Heck, you can even put this down a dipstick tube if you have to measure something internal into the transmission. Not very common that you'd have to do that, but my point is, is that this is a versatile, bendable uh, product something that's not um, is beneficial when we're using a typical line pressure gauge. So when I bought this stuff, I bought it with the intent of not only doing vacuum testing, but if I ever had to do a line pressure test that I could use these same components. But the key is, is make sure it's compatible with the fluids, the oil, and also make sure that this uh, can handle pressure. And this one here was specced at 300 PSI. Most of them you'll see at like 100 or maybe 125 PSI. So you actually have to look for that spec. Another thing that you're going to have to buy is this welding tip cleaner. And this is the type that uses drill bits. And the reason why you want to buy this is because we're going to use these drill bits to create an orifice. I've filled part of this little nipple here, this extra, and you don't have to use a nipple. You can use whatever you want. I just decided to use this. I made a couple of them just in case I screwed something up. But I'm, I use a two-part epoxy, mix it up, and I put it on the inside of this uh, nipple here. And you don't have to use a nipple. You can use whatever you want. Then after that hardens up, we drill through this and we're creating a test orifice. And if you ever watch my videos, you'll notice that we always calibrate the gauge and uh, we'll calibrate it so it's, when it's plugged off, it's got 25 inches of vacuum at the gauge. And when it's flowing through an orifice, and that's where we're gonna create our test orifice here, it's gonna pull five inches of vacuum. We'll look at that in a second, the reason why they do that, but the purpose is to basically take this vacuum pump right here and make it work the same as any vacuum pump. And we'll know that a leak of a specific size is gonna create five inches of vacuum and a perfect seal is gonna create 25 inches of vacuum. So that's like the cliff notes or the shortened up version, but we, we needed to have a test orifice so you can make one yourself and you needed to have a drill bit to drill the hole to create the test orifice size and the, the hole small. It's like a 35 thousandths of an inch hole. I apologize if you've been watching my videos and you hear me say 40 thousandths of an inch hole a lot. That's actually what a cylinder leakage tester does, that cylinder leakage for an engine has a 40 thousandths orifice. Well, 
the kind of the standard for valve body testing is a 35, 34 or 35 thousandths hole. And you do have a 35 thousandths drill bit in these little um, welding tip cleaner kits. So we can take that 35 thousandths drill bit, drill a hole through our epoxy, and create our own little test orifice. Then you're going to want to probably identify this so that you don't end up using it somewhere because it's plugged off. That would be a bad deal. Or you don't just lose it because it looks like everything else. Maybe spray paint it, do something to make it look different than everything else. So I got this laid out on the bench, pretty much how I'm going to construct it. Vacuum's going to come into this push fitting. It's going to go through this needle valve. I'm going to go through this T and up to my vacuum gauge so I can read vacuum. I'm going to leave through this nipple, through another T, and we're going to have this needle valve right here opened up to atmosphere. That's going to be like a, a regulated bleed orifice, if you will. And then I'm going to go to another push fitting, which will go to a hose, which will then give me some ability to go through and actually vacuum check these ports. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble these things. I've got Teflon tape, so I can wrap all these threaded connections, and I'm going to snug them up. And you'll see here in a second what the finished product looks like. All right, here's the finished product. I got my push fitting going into this needle valve through this brass T up to the vacuum gauge and through a eighth inch nipple to another T up to this needle valve. That's going to be an air bleed and then into this push fitting and that's going to go out to the work. So this is going to be the vacuum pump coming in and then this is going to be out to my valve body test plate. So that's about $60 worth of stuff right there. Now we also needed to make, as I mentioned before, our orifices and I made two of them. I really only need to make one. I already had epoxy on hand, so I'm assuming that some of these things you have laying around. And I just kind of mix up a little bit. You only want to fill this about an eighth of an inch with epoxy. By the time I mixed up the epoxy, I ended up having more than enough, so I decided I'd just go ahead and make two of them. And this is going to be for our calibrated orifice, so that way we can calibrate this gauge to pull five inches of vacuum through this 35 thousandths of an inch hole. Now once that epoxy sets up, we can go through and use our welding tip cleaner and drill a hole through it. This is that 35,000 drill bit. I actually have it chucked up in the welding tip holder body because that drill bit is way too small for my drill to hold on to. These things don't really drill very true, but we're drilling through epoxy, so it's not like it's going to fight us too much. Just center it as well as you can. You probably want to go through this a bunch of times to the point where you know this drill bit just kind of slides in and out. Once I've drilled it out, I actually kind of just work it back and forth in there to kind of clean this out. This is just one way to do it. There's, I'm sure, a dozen other ways that you can do it. The first one I made, I actually had a cut plug that I pulled out of a salvage pump. It was a little smaller than 34,000, so I used the same drill bit, opened it up a little bit, and I've been using it. I just actually kind of have it stuffed into a, a little um, vacuum adapter out of a Mighty Vac test pump kit. That's always worked well for me, but this is just another way you can do it. You can fill this up with epoxy, drill through it. You can take a little slug of aluminum and drill the hole through it. So any way you want, but this is, like I said, this is just an example, and this is just how I've made a couple of these. And now on to the vacuum pump. This vacuum pump I also bought off Amazon. It was $65. It's rated at two and a half cubic feet per minute, which is plenty, I guess, for what we're doing. And um, it did not have the actual fitting, and it had an R12, R134A fitting on here, so kind of like a combined fitting there. So I'd take it out, but it's also a quarter-inch pipe thread, so I was able to thread in a quarter-inch push connect fitting. I did not include that pretty much in the little description and costs and all that, because depending on what kind of vacuum pump you've got, that connection might be different. Some of the other vacuum pumps I have here have much different connections, but this one is a quarter inch pipe thread and you could do a quarter inch to an uh, adapter or like I said, I actually had a quarter inch push, to, push fitting connection, so I just threaded that in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this connection with my hose here, push this quarter inch line down into that push fitting, tight fit. This push fitting right here on this vacuum pump is not very good. They were really cheap. Um, I got those a while ago. Probably should have checked the ratings. The ones, though, that you have listed here on this, uh, this video for this about well, eighth inch pipe thread, but these metal ones, they're really good by comparison. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this little plastic line. 
All right, so this is my vacuum inlet right here. So when I turn this vacuum pump on, now I got a vacuum source going to my gauge setup. Now I'm going to cut a piece of hose that I'll end up using to test the transmission. Plug it in on this side. As you can see that when we're done, we got some extra stuff, like we got this extra line that we can use for pressure testing, the transmission. We got a couple extra push fitting connections. So even though this stuff costs a little bit of money, you're still left with extra components that you can use elsewhere, which is kind of nice. Now at the end of this hose, we could do a variety of things. I went ahead and took an air gun tip and put a coupler on there with another push fitting so I could just slide that on there like so. You could take a piece of vacuum hose and slide it over the fitting and maybe a barb. You can adapt it any way you want. And I just chose to use this method because I can pretty easily pump through my calibrated orifice just by sticking the nozzle into it. And then when I go to test the transmissions, I can just go straight into the test plate. So that's just how I did it. So now we're going to go through and calibrate this gauge set. And we, the reason why we need to do that is because we need to make sure that we get repeatable results. And I've got these two needle valves and they're going to be responsible for my calibration. The, the one side, this adjustment right here, is going to be what I'm going to do to get my 25 inches of vacuum. And this side over here is what I'm going to use to get my 5 inches of vacuum when I'm pulling through that calibrated orifice. And once again, we use these numbers so that way we can equalize, level the playing field, so that way we can get repeatable results. This 25 inches right here is we're going to have different vacuum pumps of different strengths. So I know that if I plug this off and I seal this completely, if anything above 25 inches of vacuum, if I can leak out through this orifice right here, through this air bleed, that's going to equalize the playing field for a weaker pump versus a stronger pump. And then this 5 inches of vacuum is what we're going to be setting this up for when we're pulling through a 35 thousandths of an inch hole. So we know that any leak equivalent to a 35 thousandths of an inch hole, when we check it, is going to show up as five inches of vacuum. Obviously, we're not going to use this calibrated orifice when we're checking the valve body, but the idea is that if I go over and check a circuit on a valve body or in a transmission, and I only see five inches on this gauge, then I know that's equivalent to a 35 thousandths of an inch hole leak. That's a pretty good size leak, so I'm going to expect anything above that. If I'm re reading below five inches of vacuum, then it's a bigger leak than the uh, 35 thousandths of an inch hole. And under that same respect, if I read 25 inches when I'm checking something, that means it's a perfect seal, that there's nothing sneaking past it. Because when I plug this off, I get 25 inches, and then when I pump it through my calibrated orifice, I get five inches of vacuum. So it gives me an idea what a perfect seal is going to do, and it's also going to give me an idea of what a leak at 35 thousandths of an inch is going to do. So between five inches of vacuum and 25 inches of vacuum is equivalent to a 35 thousandths of an inch hole all the way up to a perfect seal. So let's go ahead and calibrate this thing. I got my vacuum pump off of the table to give me a little bit of room. Now if I plug this off, you can see I'm getting way more than 25 inches of vacuum. Or not way more, but I'm getting more. So I'm going to bleed some of this air off by opening this needle valve. Okay, so that's, eight, that's 25 inches of vacuum. Taking my finger off that hole and I'm going to go ahead and pump it through my calibrated orifice. I'm going to go and close off my inlet until I get 5 inches of vacuum. And I will tell you we're going to need to go back and forth and do this a bunch of times until we stabilize it. So right now is just under five, plug it off. Close to 25 inches of vacuum. That's the calibrated orifice. Oops. So my calibrated orifice is Pretty close to five and plugging it off completely. Pretty close to 25. I could nudge my needle valve there a little bit and get it maybe a little better. So at this point, this gauge is calibrated and I can go ahead and start checking valve bodies or transmission cases or whatever. One thing to mention is that these cheaper vacuum pumps, they're a lot noisier and they actually do smoke quite a bit more than your higher end vacuum pumps. So. Keep that in mind. And now that we've got our vacuum test station built, we can go ahead and check some valves. Now, I haven't really found a good replacement for what Sonics has. This is their wet air test plate. 
and it's a chunk of plexiglass. And they also give you these rubber gaskets. This one's got some uh, paint pen marks on it. But um, it's nice for providing a seal. Before they came up with this, you'd have to put like some trans gel around there. And you'd, they actually have had this for a long time. They used to call it a wet air test plate because they used to say check it by filling it with fluid and then pushing a little bit of air and see if it leaks through. Thank God they came up with vacuum testing because that always made a mess. You had to wear a raincoat every time you did something like that. But So checking with the plexiglass alone, you end up leaking around it too much. So the little silicone gasket that they have is see-through, so you can kind of see what you're checking, and you can get in between it and underneath it. This test plate kit is like $20, and it comes with a gasket, and you can buy replacement gaskets because they do tend to swell or um, grow over time. We're going to go and fire this machine up here. First one right here is going to be my actuator feed limit valve. This is a pretty good valve body. It's checking out 23 inches of vacuum. And these are just examples. That's off of the 6L80. We got clutch select switch. Some of these things are common issues with these transmissions. About 22 and a half inches on that guy. 22 and a half inches on that. There's our compensator circuit on this one. 22 inches. Chrysler four speed rear wheel drive. I'll double check my calibration. I'm getting roughly five inches of vacuum through my, my calibrated orifice, and then 25 inches when I plug it all off. So we're all good there. The circuit here, this valve that we're testing is for the three, four, the overdrive clutch circuit on the Chrysler four speed rear wheel drive. And we're pulling right around 15 inches of vacuum. And then this circuit right here is for the uh, torque converter clutch circuit on that same vehicle, four speed rear wheel drive Chrysler and it's like it was going up to about 18 and a half inches of vacuum. So there you have it. In a short period of time we we're able to go through and build a gauge and start vacuum testing valve bodies and transmission components and there's many benefits to vacuum testing. One is that if you got a transmission failure and you're checking these related circuits and you find a low vacuum reading well that could be the root cause of that transmission failure. If not it's a contributing factor also, vacuum testing will save you money in the long run because instead of going through and changing valves that are commonly failed, you actually can go through and check those. And if they test out perfectly fine, then you can leave them and you don't have to spend the money on the valve or even the reamer if you don't have it. So using vacuum testing could save you money in the long run by not changing parts that don't need to be changed and also by identifying marginal parts that could cause a transmission to fail while it's still under your warranty. And lastly, it can give you a little bit of ease of mind because if you find a failed circuit, that could be A, the root cause, or B, a future failure. So hopefully if you're not into vacuum testing yet and after watching this and realize that you could build this complete setup for between $150 to $175, including the vacuum pump, that you'll go ahead and get into vacuum testing. It will save you money. If it prevents one comeback, it definitely paid for itself. So consider building a vacuum test station and start vacuum testing these valve bodies. In the description for this video, I'm going to include all the links for the Amazon parts that I bought. Now, I'm not endorsing Amazon by any means. You can go to auto parts store, your hardware store, all that stuff. You can buy all this stuff. It's probably not even that much more expensive. The one thing you'll probably have to order for sure, though, is this wet air test plate. And you could probably go to a hardware store and get a chunk of a plexiglass that will work fine. But getting this clear gasket is, I can't really find anywhere where you can buy that just locally. So you'll probably, it's, it's worth your while to just go ahead and order this thing. I think it's 20 bucks for the plate and a gasket. And you can go through and just start checking these things. It creates a nice seal. If you just use a generic piece of plexiglass, you're going to have to use a, a, um, some trans gel or something like that to, to provide a temporary seal. And that works, but it's just not near as ideal. Before they came out with this, that's how we had to do it. And it was not very good. But once they came out with this, it was like, a dream come true. So anyway, so if anybody has any tips or tricks or anything like that on how to build their own or something they've done differently, some, some way to save some money at building these things, please feel free to comment below and share your knowledge with the rest of us. But otherwise, I hope to see you on the next video. Thank you.